Welcome to a special episode of the Space Policy Show. We are unveiling a new paper, The Value of Space, which highlights the diversity of ways in which we rely on satellite systems in our day-to-day -day lives. We have a three-part episode. First, we have keynote remarks from Ellen Stofan, the director of the National Air and Space Museum. Second, we have the authors, Sam Wilson and Mick Gleason, who are going to talk about the different topics raised in the earlier segments. And third, we have a panel moderated by Marina Corin of The Atlantic. Just a reminder, please engage with us, hashtag The Space Policy Show on Twitter, ask your questions in, on Vimeo and the comment box. We love questions, we love engaging, we love answers or answering questions. So please ask away, there is no small question. And this is such a great topic because it literally affects each and every one of us. Every day we are engaging on space in some way or another. Without further ado, I'll introduce Ms. Dauphin, the John and Adrian Mars Director of the National Air and Space Museum, one of the most popular museums in the world and my personal favorite. She started in April 2018 and is the first woman to hold this position. Prior to joining the Smithsonian, she had 25 years of experience in space-related organizations and a deep research background in planetary geology. She was chief scientist at NASA from 2013 to 2016. She helped guide the development of a long range plan to get humans to Mars and worked on strategies for NASA to support commercial activity in low Earth orbit. She supported NASA's overall science programs in heliophysics, Earth science, planetary science and astrophysics. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much to the Aerospace Corporation Center for Space Policy and Strategy for inviting me to speak with you. Today's program focuses on a topic that's very important to me, space, including the specific impact that human activities in, in orbit and beyond have on our lives. As a planetary scientist, former chief scientist of NASA, and now as director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, there's no topic I find as exciting or as fundamental to scientific discovery, technological development, and economic growth as this one. The study of space begins and ends here on Earth. From ground-based observations to interplanetary probes in human spaceflight, the improvement of life on Earth has been the impetus for and guiding principle behind all space exploration. Why do we explore? What do we hope to gain? What waits for us on the moon, on Mars, and beyond? The answer was, is, and always will be found here at home. Today's speakers are going to discuss the many ways space improves our world. So I'd like to begin with a little history on how we got here and what the journey has brought us so far. On Christmas Eve, 1968, humans reached the moon for the first time. The flight of Apollo 8 marked many milestones from the first crewed launch of the giant Saturn V rocket to the famous live television broadcast from lunar orbit, which saw three astronauts reading from the book of Genesis to one billion people back on Earth. But the most enduring impact of the mission and perhaps of the entire Apollo program was an unexpected photograph. Earthrise was an instant icon and appeared on newsstands around the world in the days after the mission. Many recalled a magazine cover bearing the image and the one word caption, Dawn. The idea of an ascendant Earth defi defying the inky black cosmos that surrounded it gave a bright moment of hope to millions of people around the world and is credited with sparking the modern environmental movement and a new sense of popular planetary awareness. And yet when the space race began, it wasn't positioned as a great adventure or an urgent matter of exploration or even national pride, at least at the onset. It was presented in purely geopolitical terms as a response to the Soviet Union's stunning achievements in space. Our first astronauts were soldiers riding atop repurposed weapons of war in an ostensibly peaceful analog for an otherwise unthinkable nuclear chess. 
And yet those same astronaut soldiers became some of the most important diplomats visiting the Soviet Union after their flight to a warm welcome, ultimately helping to usher in detente. Our world today is largely defined by the social and technological legacy of that era. And now more than 50 years after we first set foot on the moon, we're entering a new space age and it is poised to be even more transformational than the first, especially if some future astronaut on Mars finds concrete evidence that life evolved on the red planet. The commercial, scientific, and security developments of the space around Earth has been a priority of space agencies and commercial partners for decades. With the completion of the International Space Station and, uh, and countless constellations of satellites, 2,200 active satellites in the sky, according to today's report, our efforts in low Earth orbit are expanding and in the next 10 years, we will become ever more dependent on our orbital infrastructure to support our way of life here on the ground. Consider the stunning social, economic, and security implications of the GPS system now entering its third decade as a global public asset. Now apply that scale of transformational change to critical sectors like oceanography and agriculture, which we'll discuss here today. Recent reports on the impacts of saltwater intrusion on coastal farmland, for example, and the devastating effects it has on farmers and their families starkly illustrate the imminent dangers of climate change. Our presence in space helps us identify the challenges that will define the next century and offers us possible solutions to those same problems. As sea levels rise and weather events become more extreme, Agricultural activities will require sophisticated data from Earth-observing satellites. And that's just one of the many sectors where space-based intelligence informs essential decisions to keep our economy moving forward as the catastrophic effects of climate change begin to manifest. Take water. Our satellites are now measuring in detail all aspects of the water cycle, from rainfall around the globe to levels in lakes and reservoirs, to water held in the near surface and can even watch underground aquifers drain and fill. These data not only help us plan water use in times of drought, which are becoming more severe and common in the southwestern U.S. and elsewhere due to climate change, NASA is also working with countries around the world to help manage their water supplies better. A stable water supply helps a stable food supply, which is key to stable countries enhancing national security. Climate change on Earth is also informed by planetary science across the solar system. Comparative studies of planets from greenhouse gases on Venus to interior quakes on Mars or volcanoes on the icy moons of the outer solar system enhances our understanding of Earth's complex system and our understanding of how we can protect and sustain them. To address these challenges and realize all the advances that within our reach, we have to find the right balance with the private sector so NASA can do what it does best, big picture exploration and cutting edge science, and of course, aeronautics. But it also means investing in fundamental building blocks, beginning with the diverse enabled workforce to bring all the creativity and talent of our nation to the task. This is what we focus on at the National Air and Space Museum. It includes infrastructure, both in terms of technology and in academy level science in astrophysics, heliophysics, earth science, and planetary science. That research guides us where and how to look for answers to the questions we have today and generates the questions we've never considered that will drive our ongoing exploration. As we celebrated the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 last summer, our museum spent time thinking about what it took to meet such an audacious challenge as landing humans on the surface of the moon just eight and a half years after a young president set the goal. It took a national commitment, steady and reliable funding, and an understanding that with giant leaps comes risk. But that risk is what leads to great rewards with investments in technologies that can transform our economy and keep us at the forefront of the world. 
the challenges and opportunities of this moment, like those 50 years ago when we first landed on the moon, can lead to amazing, enduring achievements for the benefit of all humankind. I can't wait to hear what ideas today's panelists have to further those goals and what future we can envision together. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Those were amazing remarks. I now want to introduce the two lead authors of the paper, Sam Wilson and Mick Gleason. Sam Wilson on Missile Nuclear Command and Control International Space Issues. He was actually on the Space Policy Show two weeks ago for a paper we released on Japan's space security activity. If you haven't seen that episode, you should catch it. Mick works on space deterrence, space traffic management, and international space, among other issues. Mick's most recent paper was released in January on the future of national technical means given the precariousness of New START, an issue that is consistently in the headlines. Over to you, Sam and Mick. Mick, before we begin, I think we should thank some folks. Uh, I first want to thank, we first should thank Ellen Stofen. Uh, I couldn't think of a better person to introduce this topic than, than Ellen. Um, she's so impressive. She gave such wonderful remarks. And Nick, I was so impressed with her backdrop. What an amazing <laughs> backdrop. She had the, the three globes, the built-in bookcases, the NASA astronaut figurine. It, it was really something special. We'll have to have Joseph uh, show a picture of her backdrop when we talk about this, but I was... I, I was really impressed. You also, Mick, have a very nice academic uh, backdrop as well. <laughs> it took me 30 years to uh, build this uh, wall up here. So. Um, Thanks for noticing. I do. I always notice. Uh, we should also thank uh, the panelists. That's going to be the section after this. We've had the, the luxury of being able to watch the panel first. Um, Marina Corinne is the moderator. James Lohenberg or uh, and Mike Ford are both going to be talking about agriculture and oceanography. I, you know, I was really happy that Marina did this because you know, she, she's such a great writer, and, and I think her writing is really able to show the, the human side of space, which is one of the things we were trying to do with this paper. Um, I was also impressed with Marina. She, she was so funny. You know, she's funny in her writing, but she, she was funny in, in the video in the, in the segment that's after this one. And uh, that's hard to do. I make I, a couple episodes ago I, on the Japan show. I, I tried to make some jokes and they fell completely flat. So, um, so yeah, it's par for the course for you, Sam. <laughs> you love the other hand your jokes. That was good. That was good. Uh, and then, Mick, uh, we should also thank, it wasn't just you and I who wrote this, uh, Luke Griesbeck, uh, Samira Patel. They were contributing authors. That they, they wrote really important sections of the paper. Um, uh, Jim Vetta, Russell Rumbaugh were integral to this process, too. So we should, we should mention them. As, and, of course, Joseph Kohler, who, um, who organized and, and put this whole event on. Yeah, it was definitely a team effort. And so thanks to everyone for contributing to it. So, Mick, to, to introduce this paper, I, I wanted to ask you, you know, you've, you've been working in space for such a long time. Uh, you just brought up, you know, the, the wall that you've been putting together for 30 years. You know, why do you think this subject is so important? You know, the use, the value of, you know, everyday space, the use of space and, you know, in, in normal life. Well, why do you think that subject is so important? Well, you know, way back in the Cold War, when I started in the space business, the uh, it was there wasn't that much commercial space. There was SATCOM telecommunication satellites that uh, were were uh, part of uh, you know the telecommunications networks. But other than that, there wasn't that much. The military was just starting to use it uh, at the tactical level. Uh, otherwise, it was mainly at the, at the strategic level and the intelligence side that was using space assets. So over the last thirty years, it's really become very gradually more and more integral into American society where everybody is affected by it now, not just some top level people. Um, GPS in the 1990s, uh, remote sensing, commercial remote sensing satellites and more and more and more satellites. It's just been a gradual process over 30 years. And if you weren't paying attention, uh, you don't realize that now it's embedded in our daily life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was well put. Yeah. I mean, I, I have, uh, several decades fewer uh, experience than you, but um, but I but I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, even working on these days, these issues every single day, you know, you, you miss uh, 
uh, how much, you know, how pervasive um, satellites are. So um, yeah, they're kind of they're kind of out of sight, out of mind. You right. know, you don't see them; they're invisible. Uh, right. So yeah, you have to really be paying attention and, and kind of want to look for them to to realize they're there. So Mick, the the next segment um, is going to be this panel that's going to be really focusing on agriculture and oceanography. Um, two sections that we cover in the paper, but we cover you know the use of space not just on those two sectors, but a variety of sectors. You know, the paper addresses the use of satellites for commercial fishing, environmental monitoring, weather forecasting, emergency response, banking, trade, and national defense. And I may have forgotten something in there. Um, what, what section surprised you the most? You know, where was there a bigger use of satellites than, than you were expecting? Yeah, something I, I personally had never really thought much of before. Um, was the renewable energy, you know, uh, use of weather satellites, remote sensing satellites, and uh, the electric grid using yeah, yeah. Uh, satellites so much. Um, so, for example, uh, if it's going to be a windy day, the the managers of the electric grid nationally, they want to know where the sun is going to be shining or where it's going to be cloudy. They want to know where it's going to be windy or where it's going to be calm so that they can manage the the, the bursts of energy coming in from the different renewable sources or the sudden drops in energy coming in from the renewable sources. And uh, so I, I just think that's really interesting. I never really thought of that before about how they have to manage very dynamically the electric grid um, because renewable energy just kind of comes and goes with the weather. And so they're really dependent on those weather satellites. And then of course, GPS timing to help synchronize the grid down to the nanosecond. Um, uh, all mixing much more efficient than it otherwise would be and helping benefit benefit our electricity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was well put. And um, I didn't actually mention the electric grid, so I'm glad that that uh, that, that you brought that up. That was one section that that I didn't uh, didn't list. Um, yeah, well, that, that just that just uh, if I can jump in there, Sam. Yeah. So yeah, as, as, as you recall, when we uh, were putting this paper together back at the beginning, we struggled for a couple of weeks just to figure out what can we, there's so much that that space is integral to, you know, we, right. we could have made a 150 page or 300 page paper, but we had to get it down to about 15 pages of what the current pa paper is. So we really had to s carefully select some uh, exemplar, ex you know, exemplars of where space is integral into society. But there's so much more we could talk about even in this paper. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Mick, you know, one section that um, that surprised me was the commercial fishing piece. Um, you know, I, I spoke with a, a couple of commercial fishermen who are working in the Gulf of Mexico, and, you know, they told me basically every day, you know, they're using basically every category of satellites. You know, they're, they're in the middle of the Gulf, so they don't get good cell phone reception, so they have satellite phones. Uh, the weather is obviously really turbulent and you know volatile in the <clears throat> in the Gulf. So um, they have specialized weather services for fishermen, um, and including from from weather satellites. And then they uh, they use some of the the remote sensing uh, data that that Mike's going to talk about in the next panel. But you know they're looking at something things like sea surface height um, from satellites, and that's a really good indicator of where the currents are, which is a really good indicator of where the fish are. So, you know, with that information, they could then, you know, determine where to put their, their lines, their lures, which they all geo-reference using GPS, um, so that at the end of the day, they can, they can go find them. So you know, I, I, found, I found that super, super interesting. You know, I, I kind of feel sorry for the fish, you know, back in my, my much younger days, one of my friends bought a fish finder when we went out in his boat fishing. And, and, you know, he could see little blip, blips on his screen of where the fish were. I'm like, that's like really cheating that you have a fish finder on your boat. And this was way back in the late 70s, early 80s, you know. And and so now I just I kind of feel sorry for the fish because they're at such a disadvantage that the, the fishermen can uh, just find them like that, you know, because of satellites. Of course, yeah, it helps keep them be, very efficient fishing. Uh, it'll be interesting to see when the fish start using their own satellites. I think that's <laughs> when it'll start evening out. Um, uh, and so, so Mick, I'm going to use this as a good segue, um, to show some of the animations that, that we have. So I, I also, we didn't thank, uh, Jacob Bain, who put together some really compelling still graphics in our paper. And then Brian Dionisi did these animated graphics that we're going to show here. So th this first one is, is on oceanography. Um, 
you know, Noah uses uh, things called, he uses these drones on the surface of the water that look like sailboats. These are called, fittingly enough, sail drones, which is one of the ways that Noah collects information on the sea surface and transmits it to satellites. The, sand, the sail drones can also detect acoustic signatures from marine animals, such as this whale. This whale also has a transmitter on it that is relaying information to satellites. Mike, in the next uh, panel, is going to discuss this pro process, satellite telemetry. But you know, with that data, NOAA can then issue advisories to ships so they could avoid protected species. So that's why you see you know, here the ship is steering away to avoid the whale. Yeah, that's, that's amazing stuff. So I, I now also want to introduce the agriculture graphic. So this is, um, you know, the tractor here is using GPS signals for its navigation. As, as James will discuss in the next panel, uh, you know, the, the farmer is also using satellite imagery to assess the health of the crops. So this is a really cool uh, animation from, from Jago. Um, Nick, why don't you walk us through the, the shipping animation graphic that we have here? All right, thanks. So my, uh, I, I was also surprised at the, the extent that the supply chain, international global supply chain uses satellites. And so this, uh, this graphic, I think it illustrates that uh, pretty well. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory, but you know, you got someone making an order, uh, something off the internet, you know, it goes out to some factory or company somewhere. They, they put it in a shipping container, uh, depending on where it's coming from, I guess, you know, it's going to go on a ship. Now, individual shipping containers are tracked. They have uh, GPS uh, receivers and on them and satellite communication transponders on them to to be uh, two-way communication with satellites so they, they know where the, the containers are uh, precisely. Uh, the container gets into a shipyard. Uh, they know exactly where that container is in a shipyard. Have you ever seen a shipyard full of containers? There's like millions of containers just all over a shipyard. Uh, so that they know exactly where that container is, uh, much more efficient. They put it on a truck, you know, and you, you, you can track your product coming to your house. Uh, and then, it, you know, the, the delivery driver is sending you updates and you're like waiting at the front door uh, to, to get your package. That doesn't just all happen, you know, without some, some very modern uh, infrastructure uh, that, that we have today, thanks to satellites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Um. Okay, uh, so Vic, I, I also wanted to ask you. You know, we have a we have a section at the paper about what comes next. You know, what um, you know, the new technologies. You know, five G, Internet of Things, robotics. Uh, I wanted to get your perspectives on, on what you think is going to be, you know, really you know game shifting. Yeah. So, uh, you know, one of the most terrifying terrifying things uh, in my life the last few years has been having to teach my kids how to drive, my teenagers. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, wait till you get that experience, Sam. You're going to love it. But uh, so I'm really looking forward to autonomous vehicles in the future, whether it's uh, cars, self-driving cars. Of course, there's, a uh, you know, ships, uh, potentially, you know, uh, UAVs that are all uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, and, um, you know, the very large constellations of satellites that are coming in the future that are going to be uh, very interactive with us down on the earth uh, on the person to person or app by app level uh, to, to help enable something like autonomous cars. Uh, you know, if we're lucky, uh, maybe uh, my, the generation my kids are in will be the last generation that actually has to learn how to drive. I'm hard yeah. to imagine, but, but I could not have imagined the internet or GPS when I was growing up. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's true. I, I need to learn how to drive stick shift. I feel as if that's, there's no way that's going to, that's going to be a thing anymore. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think it's worth pointing out that, you know, we highlight how integral satellites are, you know, there's, and that's based on the, you know, 2200 satellites that are currently in orbit. You know, if you, if you look at some of these projections based on, you know, what some of these companies are proposing in terms of, you know, these huge constellations they're planning to put up, you know, you could have numbers, you know, looking more like 50,000 by 2030. So, so it's, you know, it's hard to imagine what additional things uh, uh, satellites are going to be able to do, you know, when, when we have this huge network, if that gets actualized. So I think, 
uh, you know, with Samira and Luke, we'll have to do a value of space paper part two uh, in 2030, Mick. So, uh, yeah, that could that, that could be, you know, the the uh, and you know the the satellites and the satellite constellations just they they provide such a backbone for all the the modern applications and high technology that we use, you know, consumers use, governments use, businesses use. And so, yeah, it's going to be a whole nother world again in, uh, in another decade. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, so, Mick, well, just one last question for you. You know, what would be one takeaway you would want the reader to, to come away with after uh, after looking at this paper? Well, kind of circling back to where I started, the, uh, you know, satellites have just be become so integral to our lives very gradually over the last 30 years and so the the more we know that and the more people that know that and understand that and realize that i think the better because uh, there's no going back you know this is how the modern 21st century society is structured on on these backbones of satellite constellations and so forth and so just like electricity and mass communications was the backbone of 20th century society you know, you, and you can't go back to, to a day without mass communications or without electricity, of course, right? right? Well, there's no going back. We're only moving forward into the 21st century and that's gonna depend to a very large extent on satellites. And uh, so we need to know that and we need to protect that. Perfect, perfect. Okay, um, Nick, unless there's anything else that you have, I think we can pass this back to, to Rebecca. All right, and uh, yeah, the, the panel coming up, I think, is really spectacular. I got a sneak preview, and so uh, stick around for that. Yeah, sounds great. All right, thanks, Mick. Okay, that was a great discussion, and thanks for introducing the paper, which is available on our website at aerospace.org slash policy. Now I want to introduce Marina Corin, who will moderate our panel. Marina covers space and recently COVID issues for the Atlantic. She has written extensively on NASA, the space industry, black holes, exoplanets, and all other interesting phenomena in space. I'll pass it over to you, Marina. Thanks again. Thanks, Rebecca. And thank you to our panelists, and thank you to everyone who is watching this from home. I'm excited to have a discussion today about something that most people don't usually think about and possibly never think about, and that's the many, many satellites currently orbiting our planet. So today we have with us Michael Ford. Uh, Michael is an oceanographer from NOAA Fisheries. Michael works on satellite technology issues and observational issues for the National Marine Fisheries Service. Michael, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. And we also have James Lowenberg de Boer, the Elizabeth Creek Professor of Agrotechnology Economics at Harper Adams University in the United Kingdom. Uh, James has 30 years of experience working on the economics of high-tech agriculture. Welcome, James. I hope the time difference isn't too uh, painful for you right now. Oh, thank you for having me. So when most of us think about what humankind does in space, um, we picture we probably picture astronauts in spacesuits and rovers going to Mars and probably um, SpaceX rockets taking off, like the one that's about to be taking off in just a couple of weeks to the International Space Station. But there is so much more going on in orbit much closer to home. There is an entire exoskeleton of satellites that basically keeps civilization running. Uh, as a new paper from the Center for Space Policy and Strategy points out, we rely on satellite technology for pretty much everything these days. Though we're probably using, personally, GPS a little bit less often because we're not really straying uh, too far from home these days. And I think that's what most people are familiar with is GPS and how satellites make that possible. But there's so much more that we use and depend on satellites for. And so I'm glad to have you, Mike, and James here to talk about it. So let's start there. Um, can you start by sharing with us how satellite technology factors into the work that you do? Uh, James, would you like to start? Th thank you. Uh, the, the most successful use of uh, satellites in agriculture is, is GPS guidance. So most commercial farmers in the United States use GPS guidance on their tractors and combines. Uh, the technology is being used all over the world where there's uh, mechanized agriculture. Uh, it's filtering down to 
smaller mechanized uh, farmers uh, in the U.S. and in other parts of the world. But beyond that, we have uh, satellite technology being used in yield monitoring so farmers can more accurately map uh, which parts of their field are yielding up to expectations and which need uh, some additional management. Uh, they're using it to guide uh, variable rate application of fertilizer, pesticides, uh, and uh, it's really becoming useful in crop scouting. So uh, farmers find it difficult to uh, scout all of their fields and uh, the satellite images can help them identify where there are problems so they can spend more time uh, on uh, those areas uh, ground truthing what actually those problems are. Thanks. How about you, Michael? Uh, thanks, Marina. Yeah, the NOAA Fisheries actually uh, works in an enormous area of ocean around the United States. Our US EEZ is nearly three, 3 million square miles. Uh, and so uh, satellite observations certainly add a capability to our ships and aircraft and observers to get our work done. Uh, they provide us a view of the ocean, large areas of the ocean to understand uh, surface oceanography, what's the temperature of the water. Uh, we're able to take a look at the color of the ocean from satellites and understand how much algae is growing. And we're able to directly look at things uh, from images from satellites. Uh, we can look at fishing vessels that might be involved in illegal activity in our EEZ. We're able to image marine debris and oil spills with specialized radars from satellites. And we're able to use satellite constellations and transmitters on certain marine animals to track their movements throughout the ocean, which give us an idea of, of how they behave and uh, an idea of the conditions that they live in and the ecology that they depend on. So satellites uh, for our mission have a broad array of uses uh, that certainly complement um, the traditional ways of observing marine life. Uh, Mike, you mentioned um using satellites to study the color of the ocean. And I, as a layperson, hear that and think, well, the ocean is blue. What do you need to study the color <laughs> of the ocean for? Um, yeah. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. Um, looking at the color of the ocean from satellites uh, is a great capability uh, for NOAA. Um, the satellites that we have in low Earth orbit have sensors that can look at all the different wavelengths of light being reflected by the ocean. And they can parse out different colors very precisely. And those colors are related to plant pigments. So we can understand by the color of the light from the ocean that we see from satellites, uh, we can calculate roughly how much chlorophyll, the plant pigment, uh, is in the ocean surface. And that gives us an idea on how productive the oceans are. Now, algae is the base of the food chain. It's what fish eat. So by looking at this over great areas of the ocean, we can get an estimate of how productive those waters might be. Um, it gives us an environmental intelligence uh, surrounding all our valuable commercial fisheries and our precious protected resources. Um, and with that beautiful color imagery, the maps that we create around our country, um, we're able to see fronts and eddies and structures in the ocean uh, that are important for us to understand as we develop um, a really great sense of the ecosystem surrounding these things. And hi, um, what kind of resolution is that imagery at? Like how, what kind of detail can you see in these currents and eddies? Yeah, since, since the first satellite that did this uh, in the late 70s, we're now able to look at things uh, one kilometer or less on the ocean surface. Um, which is fantastic for us. Uh, new technologies are being prepared that'll get us down to 300 meters. Um, so we're able to take a look at coastal embayments and closer to the coast. And it seems every year we get a much more precise look, a higher resolution picture of what's happening in the ocean. James, is there an analog to this in, in the agriculture sector? Is there a benefit to using satellite imagery to check on the health of crops or just um, study what's going on on land as well? 
there's a clear analog. Uh, so uh, plants that have an adequate amount of nitrogen are very dark green. And uh, other plants uh, that don't have an adequate amount of nitrogen might be lighter colored. And so uh, this can be detected from uh, satellite imagery to uh, guide nitrogen application. There's also uh, related technologies that look at uh, the spectra of the light reflected by various crops, and it differs by crop. And so a crop that's uh, infected by a disease, a plant disease, might uh, subtly change uh, the, the light reflected, which can be detected from uh, a satellite image and then uh, prompt a, uh, a management uh, response. That, it, it's so interesting to hear you say spectra and, and why that's important in these images because usually when you hear um, about that it's in the it's in the field of astronomy you know studying the spectra of exoplanets and stars and galaxies but here we're looking down at uh, at ocean currents and leaves it kind of feels like cheating that we're able to unlock their secrets that way but I suppose it helps um, <laughs> but we're also looking at wildlife so satellites are also um, play a big role in animal tracking, which um, Mike, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about. Sure. Yeah, we, uh, we use a, a few systems to track animals with satellites. Um, one of them is the Argos uh, satellite telemetry system. Uh, it's a constellation of satellites. Um, that's actually a collaboration between the French Space Agency, NOAA, um, an agency called UMETSAT which works on weather satellites for the EU, and the Indian Space Agency. Uh, they all work together to build a large constellation of uh, satellites that receive transmissions from small transmitters uh, that we can place uh, safely on lots of marine life, uh, marine mammals, sharks, fish, turtles. Um, and um, as the satellites spin around the globe and uh, these animals surface, they can transmit their location tracks um, we can get those back at data centers. So we have a chance to learn a ton about these populations. Uh, we're able to learn where sharks go. Um, and with the newest transmitters, we can know how, how deep they dive. We can understand what the temperature of the water was, what their environmental conditions are. Um, for long periods of time, almost a year, we can track animals. We've found you know, new locations where they're spawning places where they feed, seasonal uh, patterns um, that have provided us great uh, scientific information um, as we looked at how to um, you know, best handle uh, commercial fisheries and protected species. So yeah, tracking animals uh, is a wonderful capability that we have uh, and enjoy with a number of partners here at NOAA. What is the most difficult type of wildlife to track? Is that something that you think about? Yeah, birds. Um, yeah, we, uh, the Argos satellite telemetry system is unique. Uh, its satellites can hear uh, very faint uh, signals from tiny transmitters, uh, something that might be as light as three grams that we can place in a seabird um, with a, a, you know, a fraction of a watt of energy can actually transmit and be received by this satellite hundreds of kilometers uh, above the surface of the earth. So birds are a really important part of our ecology and uh, to be able to track them um, is critically important for our mission as well. And so we're lucky to have the telemetry from satellite to help us with that. Uh, I'm curious how uh, we got to where we are now um, where so much of uh, your work and just daily life relies on technology, satellite technologies. Um, when satellite services were first introduced uh, in the agriculture sector, James, um, how were how were they received by farmers? Was there any hesitation or skepticism? Well, farmers are always looking for new technology because it's well known that uh, a farmer to be successful needs to stay uh, ahead of uh, the technology uh, advance. Uh, but they're also very cautious because they want technology that pays for itself. Uh, and makes them uh, makes them money. And so when satellite services were first introduced, uh, a few farmers would use it. 
uh, and uh, there were many initial problems in delivering the, uh, the, the images, in the analysis of the images, and so on and so forth. Uh, and it took a while, it took some years for uh, the kinks to be worked out uh, of the system. And uh, the way you can tell that in the adoption data, if you see a technology that regularly has just a few percent of farmers using it, that means that there's people who like the idea and they're trying it and they keep trying it in the hopes that the, the uh, technology uh, issues will be worked out. And then when it's worked out, you'll see the adoption take off. So uh, there's this, uh, yes, we're really interested, uh, but uh, it has to pay. Let's say there was a significant disruption of some kind to the satellite infrastructure um, and there was a disruption to the work that you do. Um, what kinds of effects would be felt? What would, would it be like to be plunged back into a, a more traditional way of doing things? Um, James, if, you, if you'd like to go first. A lot of the, the efficiencies that have been uh, added into the system uh, with satellite uh, technology uh, would, would disappear. So that uh, skip and overlap would be up back up around 10% instead of being down under 1%. Uh, the um, ability to uh, identify crop problems in large fields without walking over every square foot uh, then uh, becomes, uh, becomes much more difficult. And so problems would be missed or they might be noticed only when it's too late to actually uh, do, uh, do some kind of, of management. So uh, it, it, it would be possible, but one of the issues is some of the older technologies are uh, no longer uh, available. So one of the examples there is uh, planter, planting machines used to have disc markers, which made a physical mark in the soil where uh, the next uh, planting round would go. Well, most planters aren't equipped with that anymore. And so uh, they uh, would not have that older technology to go back to. How about for you, Mike? Yeah, um, boy, I don't think I wanna go back to a time when we don't have satellites uh, helping us out. Um, you know, the, the work that we do from ships and aircraft, um, you know, wouldn't be complemented by these great tools that we have in orbit. Um, we'd have to roll back to a place where we don't have these synoptic views of uh, at the continental shelf scale you know, of the open ocean. We wouldn't be able to have um, easily created you know, maps of what's happening on the surface ocean for temperature and ocean color. Uh, we wouldn't have these long offshore tracks of marine animals anymore. Uh, we'd have to send more ships out. Uh, send more aircraft out, um, but there are limits. Um, you know, that's an enormous area uh, for us to cover in our mission. Um, so we'd, we'd have to do a lot of that. We'd be rolled back to a place where we don't have um, advanced models of the way that the ocean um, circulates, uh, models that are mostly fueled by um, some initial conditions from satellites. So we'd, we'd be back to a place where we'd be doing much more work with ships, uh, at sea hardware, buoys, instrumentation. We depend much more on instruments that we cast from ships. Um, we'd have to uh, consider, um, you know, overflights of certain of a certain way to monitor marine mammals. Um, you know, we, we we did operate before there were satellites, but uh, since then uh, we benefited greatly from those new capabilities. I mean, it would be a great day for the buoy industry, I suppose. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, so these days, it, it seems that satellites are playing quite a significant role um, during the pandemic, especially because it's they're providing information that could help people better track and understand uh, understand the spread of the virus. Um, and I'm wondering if you if you feel a newfound appreciation for satellites in general, just that they're there to help when we need it in moments like this, but they're also still running. Um, you know, they're unaffected. Uh, they're, they're, they're kind of protected for the most part from the various supply chain issues and, and you know, they can't catch a virus. Like, 
how does this moment change the way you feel about um, satellite technology and what it means to us um, for whoever would like to take that question? On the agriculture side, uh, because uh, the satellite technology has made work more efficient and labor has been a big problem in agriculture during the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, and so farmers have been able to make more of the labor they have uh, by using the satellite technology. And that's been uh, very crucial. Yeah, I can, I can say that I think you said it, uh, Marina, you know, uh, it's great that the satellites are still up there. Um, they're still running. Um, and thanks to some, uh, some hard work by my NOAA colleagues, um, those data streams are still flowing. Um, so we still continue to benefit from all of that uh, on-orbit hardware, um, giving us the capabilities that uh, we've been speaking to today. What do, what do you think the next 10 or 20 or 30 years look like in the fields of oceanography and agriculture um, in the context of satellite technology? Are there gaps that you are excited about being filled in the coming years? Um, are there some gaps in our understanding of, of the world that satellites could never fill? On the agriculture side, uh, a couple of the, the technology uh, pipelines that are uh, in place are uh, greater automation and robotics in agriculture. So again, one of the responses to uh, the, the shortage or the difficulty of finding labor in agriculture is to automate. Uh, almost all of the crop robots are guided uh, by, by GPS. Uh, without that, it would, be, it would be very, very difficult. And we expect to see uh, a major uh, change in how agriculture, agricultural work is, is, is done. But maybe even more than that on the environmental side is more intense management uh, of crops. So instead of managing whole fields, whereas in the past, maybe a whole field of 100 hectares was managed all the same way, uh, now it's become possible uh, to manage that more intensely on, say, a one or two hectare basis. But in the future, we may be managing uh, that uh, crop on a meter by meter or even a plant by plant basis. So uh, this plant needs a little more nitrogen and that one needs a little more phosphorus. Uh, and that will increase productivity, but also avoid uh, applying uh, chemicals and inputs uh, where, where they're not needed. So uh, there are some really exciting developments there that depend crucially on satellite technology. That sounds surreal. It kind of sounds like the stuff of science fiction to go plant by plant from space and check on the health of that plant and say, how are you doing? Do you need some more fertilizer? But it's, it, 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 it's, it's close to reality now. You know, it can be done on a research basis. And so the question is, how do we make that technology usable uh, and profitable for farmers. Uh, Mike, are you going to be going plankton by plankton uh, be 10 years <laughs> from now? <laughs> Actually, uh, I can probably say yes. Um, you know, at, at, at NOAA, we're very grateful to um, all of our partners in aerospace. Um, they're just blowing our minds constantly with unbelievable sensors. So in oceanography, we're really excited about the advent of hyperspectral imaging. And that means looking at the color of the ocean with just many more channels. Um, we just have such, we will get such a much more detailed look at the different colors that we think we will actually be able to understand what type of algae is growing in the ocean. And that'll give us a very precise uh, way to consider how those plankton will work in the food web, um, how much of that plant pigment, how, how much of that algae will actually be utilized by fish. So having satellites that can look um, with hyperspectral images can provide us the ability to look at different groups of algae, which I think is very exciting for biological oceanography. 
for tracking animals. Um, you know, we're launching a brand new kind of sensor uh, to help uh, augment the Argos network. And we believe there's a constellation of nanosatellites being launched to complement that mission. And the more satellites you have for a tracking mission means um, more precise tracks. We don't have any gaps that every time a turtle or a whale or a shark goes to transmit, th those data make it to the satellite and back to our scientists. So exciting constellations for uh, tracking animals are, are coming up soon and we're really excited to see that. And I think the other big wave that's coming across is utilization of this imagery. Um, beautiful images are fantastic. Uh, wonderful instruments are, are, are absolutely mind blowing. But our work in artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, uh, machine vision, uh, when we apply it to those satellite images that we get, we can just, we, we can just elevate um, the performance of everything. Can look at more images faster. We can learn more. Uh, we can dive deeper into the information that's hidden within them. Um, so those three things: uh, hyperspectral images, uh, you know, new constellations for tracking animals, and um, putting in a lot of effort on in, in artificial intelligence and the way that we process it. I think are so promising uh, for the next ten years of oceanography and, and work here at NOAA. Wow. Well, I can't wait to see all of that and also compare the various images that you both <laughs> in your fields uh, emerge. Um, this has been a really fascinating discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Mike and James, for joining us. I think we're out of time, but um, really grateful for your insight and your uh, expertise on this. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Marina. We really enjoyed having you moderate our panel today. Thank you to everyone, to Ellen, to Sam, to Mick. We really appreciate you being on the show and talking to us about the value of space. It really does touch our daily lives. We really appreciate you being here. And as always, you can engage with us on Twitter, hashtag the Space Policy Show, or ask your questions on Vimeo in the comment box. And until next time, take care. <laughs>